This meeting of the Senate Judiciary Committee will come to order. We have five judicial nominees with us today. Judge Michelle Court, nominated to the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California. Judge Huang, Ann Huang, nominated to the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California. Judge Sarah Netburn, to the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. Stacy Newman, U.S. District Court for the District of Maine. Judge Cynthia Valenzuela, to the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California. Congratulations to all the nominees and their families. And later this morning, the Senate is scheduled to confirm the 200th lifetime judge since President Biden took office. I'm proud of this accomplishment. It took a lot of hard work by staff on both sides, as well as the members. Today's panel will continue our committee track record of considering highly qualified, even-handed, professionally diverse jurists for the federal bench for a lifetime appointment. The nominees before us have experience on the state and federal bench. They've been both pro prosecutors, public defenders, and civil rights uh, advocates. Such a range of perspective is going to strengthen our courts. We have a few colleagues who will make introductions. Uh, I'm going to first turn to Senator Ranking Member Graham for any opening remarks. Um, if you don't mind, we'll let Senator King go, and I'll speak after him. I know he's busy. Okay, that's kind of you. Senator Angus King of the state of Maine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, having now sat on this side and that side, I prefer that side. I can assure you. Uh, I appreciate the, the committee's time and the hard work that this committee does. I was thinking about it. You really bring more matters to the floor than any other Senate committee, and I know that is a result of very hard work by your, the members and the staff. Uh, I'm here to present uh, Stacy Newman, who is the president's nominee for the District Court of Maine, uh, and to present her qualifications. She's from Maine. Sorry. Uh, so goes uh, the nation. Uh, <laughs> uh, Stacy Newman's one of the most well-qualified candidates for judicial office that I've ever seen. She has an unusual combination of having been a federal prosecutor in the, in the uh, United States Attorney's Office in Maine and a public defender. And she's been a clerk for, a, uh, for, for the Second Circuit Court of Appeals and for a uh, state Supreme Court justice. So a very broad experience, plus uh, significant experience in the private sector, representing both plaintiffs and defendants. A breadth of experience that you rarely see in a, in a judicial candidate. And uh, she has, uh, the, one of the most things that impressed me the most, and I hope the committee will look at this, is an extraordinary letter from her colleagues in the US Attorney's Office in Maine that express extraordinary support for her candidacy. I think that's very meaningful. What we all look for here is a direct insight into the character and abilities of these candidates and to get that, uh, that assessment from their colleagues uh, in, in a pressure cooker like the U.S. Attorney's Office, I think is very important. She was also uh, unanimously rated uh, well qualified by the American Bar Association and uh, has extensive experience. As I was thinking about this, as governor uh, for eight years, I probably appointed somewhere in the range of 20 judges, uh, two Supreme Court chief justices, members of the Supreme Court, members of our various levels of trial court. So I had a, a lot of time to think about judicial nominees and what the qualities were that one should look for. And in this case, uh, th this candidate, Stacey Newman, is one of the best, most qu well qualified I've seen in, in that experience, and that includes, as governor, assessing a lot of judicial nominees. The thing that strikes me about her is, it took, for me, legal ability and experience is a kind of baseline. Uh, we expect that of all of our nominees, the, a, broad, a breadth of experience, a knowledge of the law, uh, and she certainly has that, and that's demonstrated by her background. She was on law review. Uh, they didn't let me get near law review. Uh, and uh, anybody that achieves that in law school, I'm impressed by. Uh, but in addition, and this is what's important for me, she has an extraordinary temperament and a humility. And for those of us who have practiced law, uh, we look for judges who don't put on that black robe and become autocrats. 
and become sort of overbearing. And Stacy Newman is a person who has the temperament, empathy, understanding of the uh, uh, of the issues and of the people who will uh, appear before her. So I believe that, as I say, having given my experience, she's one of the most well qualified candidates I've ever seen. That's why I'm that's why I'm here this morning. And I guess the final comment would be a test I apply as a, somebody who practiced law for almost 20 years, how would I feel appearing before her as a judge? Would I get a fair hearing? Would I get a fair shake? Would I be before someone who took the time to understand the issues and listen to the evidence? I believe Stacy Newman meets that test uh, exceedingly well, and I commend her wholeheartedly to this committee. Uh, thank thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator King. And of course, we know your busy schedule, the fact that you come to the committee on her behalf uh, speaks volumes. So thank you for joining us this morning. Thank Senator you. Senator Graham. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, tomorrow, I think we're gonna vote on the um, immigration bill. One thing I would like to point out is that <clears throat> legislation is not required to do most of what needs to be done. It just requires will. So we're gonna have a vote tomorrow, and it's just a vote to try to help help your side politically on the border. I don't think it's gonna work. The average number of people granted parole by the Trump administration and the, uh, the Obama administration was about 6,000 a year. Now, what is parole? It's executive authority granted by statute that the executive, through the Secretary of Homeland Security, can parole people into the country on a limited basis based on a unique humanitarian need, somebody's mother's dying, or special benefit to the country, maybe a witness in a, in a case. That was used about 6,000 times a year under the uh, Trump-Obama administration. It has been incredibly abused. Since we last voted in February of this year on the bill that's gonna be brought back up, 77,000 people have been paroled. There's not any change at all, and it's never going to change. So you could have demonstrated, the administration could have, taking this matter more seriously when brought up by our colleagues. Go back to the statute. You're abusing the statute. You're mass paroling people. You're waving them in. And we found that Mr. Barra, the man who's been uh, indicted for killing the, um, the young woman uh, in Georgia, is, was released through parole, not based on a humanitarian need or special benefit of the country, because El Paso was full. The man that's accused of killing Lake and Riley was let go by DHS because they had no place to put him, and he was paroled. That's not a statutory requirement. I am never going to vote for immigration reform until this administration proves to me they're serious about the job they have and are gonna change the behavior, and apparently they're not gonna change the behavior. It's getting worse, not better. 77,000 people paroled. Once you know that Republicans believe you abuse the statute, we're supposed to like believe you're gonna do something new if we change the law? It's not a law problem, it's an attitude problem. Thank you. We're checking on this, uh, Senator Graham, but do you believe the Ukrainian refugees were paroled into this country? I believe that it should be done. You don't rewrite the law. You have asylum, you have refugee status. Refugees have to apply overseas. So if you feel like you're a refugee from a war in Ukraine, you apply for refugee status. You don't use parole. Parole was not meant to become a alternative to refugees. We're double checking, I'm not sure, and I don't wanna make an assertion It turns out to be wrong for the record, but 36,000 Ukrainian refugees have come to the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois under two conditions, a sponsoring family 
and second, that they're given a work permit when they arrive. I will tell you those people have been folded into the economy of the Chicago region without incident. I don't think there's any press reporting about their presence. I, I, I think it's the right thing to do to offer the, people who are refugees in a war an opportunity to come to the United States. We did it after Vietnam. We've done it with our allies among the Kurds. Uh, and I don't think it's an unusual circumstance uh, in history. So I don't think that this yeah. uh, necessarily it, tells the whole story. Well, if, if I may, you're talking about A and I'm talking about B. I support raising the gap for refugees. We had a meeting about it. You know, it's like 125,000. I supported raising the cap. You have to apply for refugee status overseas. And there are people, I'm sure the people you described in Ukraine, uh, were very worthy of being refugees. I'm not talking about refugees. I'm talking about parole. Parole is being used in a way the statute never contemplated. It's being abused. And here's what I don't get. After one of the people you paroled illegally, Mr. Beer, killed a young lady in Georgia, they're continuing to do the same thing. So I support refugee programs. I support asylum that's applied correctly. I don't support mass abuse of parole. And from the last time we took the vote to now, things are worse, not better. Thank you. We've checked. They were paroled. Ukrainian refugees were paroled into the United States under the president. Well, they vote. violated that the, they should have been refugees, not paroled. You just can't just ignore the law. I guess you can. That's why we're all going to vote no. You can and you are. So there we you are, go. <laughs> we're voting on a bill which was characterized as a bipartisan bill. I hope it will be on the floor. So Senator Schumer wanted to be here uh, to make an introduction. And I am going to read his statement. Unfortunately, he was called away at, at the last minute. And so I'm reading Senator uh, Schumer's statement into the record relative to Sarah Nedburn. He said he was proud to recommend to President Biden to serve as district judge for the Southern District of New York. Sarah is a first-rate legal mind, a dedicated, talented public servant who is currently serving as magistrate judge in Southern District of New York manages criminal and civil cases that include complex security litigation, class action, commercial disputes, civil rights, and employment matters. Her credentials are top notch, graduate of Brown and UCLA School of Law, clerk for Judge Harry Pregerson of the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, prior to serving as magistrate judge. She spent many years litigating in federal court on behalf of individuals, corporations, and nonprofits. Over her many years in litigation, she's represented inmates, ballot access efforts, and individuals exercising their right to protest. Her experience can be summarized in one word, sweeping. She has served as Chief, Chief Counsel of the Office of Pro Se Litigation for the U.S. District Court for the District of New York. But as admirable as her experience is, so too is the impact she's had on the community. Senator Schumer says, one of the things I found most laudable in her background was she launched the Young Adult Opportunity Program, Southern District of New York's only pre-trial diversion program for young offenders. She understands that being a good lawyer and a good judge is not just about case law, but about understanding the people that the law impacts. As she once said about the job, quote, you have to be able to talk to people. Her commitment to New York over the years is honorable, and I believe this, this demonstrates her strong community values. This Democratic majority has a proud record of confirming highly qualified and talented judges. In fact, later today, we will hit the 200 judge uh, benchmark. These judges are reshaping the judiciary for the better, not only by making our courts look more like America, but also by restoring trust and balance to the bench through their broad range of experience. I'm confident that Judge Netburn will serve with distinction, and that's why I'm proud to support her nomination. Senator but Butler is here uh, and has three nominees. Would you like to speak to those nominees? Yes, uh, Chair Durbin, thank you so much, and thank you to you and the ranking member. Um, we have in front of us an incredibly powerful uh, panel of women. Um, three outstanding, talented, qualified Californians who are ready to serve, and it is uh, my honor to introduce and present them to the Committee for Consideration. If confirmed, these women will all be joining one of the most crucial courts in the country. The Central District of California serves about 17 million people, uh, making it the largest federal judici judicial district by population. The Central District is currently facing an unprecedented 
number of filings underscoring, underscoring the urgent need to fill these vacancies. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the caseload will be served with the excellence of these judges. First, I am pleased to introduce uh, current Superior Court Judge Michelle Court. Today is a celebration of her and those who love and support her, including her husband, Jamie Court, and her brother-in-law, Andy Court, uh, who are here with her today. Her two sons are at school, uh, at home, uh, proud, um, but uh, hopefully watching. Judge Court was born into a military family. Her father was a Vietnam veteran. She moved to California in high school and has called it home ever since. She attended Pomona College, where she put herself through school. She sang in the Glee Club. We've been talking about, I think one of our last nominees was a poet. Um, we, uh, in California, brought our talent uh, from the Glee Club for today's consideration. She also received her Bachelor of Arts in Sociology. After graduating college at the height of the AIDS crisis, she took one of her first steps to a lifetime of service by working for two years uh, with the AIDS Project, an organization that provided life-saving training to healthcare professionals in Los Angeles. Judge Court then pursued a legal career um, beginning at Loyola Law School. While in law school, she worked at the National Health Law Program researching healthcare services provided to incarcerating women, incarcerated women. After law school, Judge Court continued her commitment to public interest as evidenced by her time as a fellow at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. She then worked in private practice as an associate in several firms in various leadership roles at Betsetic Legal Services, including the Director of Litigation and the Vice President and General Counsel. Judge Court has served as a judge for the Los Angeles Superior Court since 2012. In 2023, she deservingly became a supervising judge, overseeing approximately 150 judges in 35 courthouses throughout Los Angeles County. The esteem and respect that her colleagues and community have for her is evident in the support that we've seen for her nomination, including letters that highlight her qualifications. One letter the committee has received in, uh, current judges, is from current judges of five distinct principals of the Los Angeles County Superior Court. They wrote, and I quote, she is currently serving as the supervising judge in the civil division of the largest unified trial court in the nation. Judge Court was selected for this position in part due to her administrative skills, technical knowledge, and being a subject matter expert in civil law procedure. Her strong management skills are illustrated by her innovative approaches to lessening the civil case law during the pandemic, end quote. Judge Court's dozens of years of experience in the Superior Court, including as its supervising judge, demonstrate her ability to smoothly transition to the District Court, and I would encourage my colleagues to, in joining me to support her nomination. Next, it is a delight to introduce to the committee current Superior Court Judge Ann Huang. Judge Huang's village is proudly watching at home today, a community that includes her parents, her brother, husband, daughter, and many other family members and friends. Judge Huang was born in Los Angeles, raised in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, California. She attended Cornell University for her undergraduate degree, then moved to South Korea teaching English to elementary school children. After her experience abroad, Judge Zhuang returned to California working at the Volunteer Bureau. Judge Zhuang attended the University of Southern California Law School. While in law school, she was an extern for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and the Office of the Federal Public Defender in the Central District of California. It is particularly notable that the committee received a letter of support from a group of former prosecutors who served on opposite sides of the cases that she worked for dozens of years as a federal public defender. This group of 11 former AUSAs wrote, and I quote, she was well prepared, understood the facts and the law, was clear in her written and oral arguments, and emphasized a commitment to excellence. Judge Wong understood her duty to provide zealous representation for her clients and did so in a fair manner. 
She also understood her cases from the perspective of a prosecutor, which was effective in her ability to provide the best representation for her clients, end quote. In addition to her clear qualifications and temperament, Judge Wong's confirmation would be a historic one. The Korean American Bar Association of Southern California wrote in a support letter to the committee, quote, the nomination of Judge Wong is of great significance to the Korean American legal community. With over 200,000 residents of Korean descent, Los Angeles County is home to the largest population of Koreans in America. Despite these statistics, the Central District of California has never had a Korean American serve as a federal district judge. If Judge Wong is confirmed, she would be the first Korean American to have this honor, end quote. Once again, I am confident of Judge Wong's presence on the bench as an excellent addition to the Central District of California, and I would urge my colleagues to join me in supporting her nomination to the federal bench. Mr. Chairman, uh, my colleague, uh, Senator Padilla, has arrived, and I don't know if he'd like to offer first comments for the recommendation of Judge uh, Cynthia Valenzuela Dixon, but I'd offer the opportunity if the chair would permit. I certainly would. Senator Padilla, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and the other California nominees, if that's okay? Sure. All right. But first, Mr. Chair, point of personal privilege. I see a lot of serious faces in the audience here. The nominees, their friends and family here in support. Can y'all just smile? <laughs> this is a good day. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, today I have the uh, great privilege of introducing three of President Biden's distinguished nominees to serve on the federal bench, all nominated to serve the Central District of California. Uh, first, I have the honor of introducing Judge Michelle Williams Court, who joined, uh, who's joined here today by her husband, Jamie, and her brother-in-law, Andy. Uh, I believe her sons are in school today, but I'm sure they're following along from California with immense pride. Judge Court earned her bachelor's from Pomona College and her JD from Loyola Law School. Early on in her career, Judge Court served as an associate at several private litigation firms, uh, a community builder fellow at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and a project attorney at the ACLU of California, quite a uh, cross-section of experience. She then worked for 10 years as Vice President and General Counsel at Betsetic Legal Services, representing thousands of low-income clients, an organization that I've been working with more than 30 years in my various positions of public service. In 2011, Governor Jerry Brown appointed her to the Los Angeles Superior Court, where she has served since with 18 years of both state and federal civil litigation experience. I'm confident that Judge Court has the professional, legal, and local experience needed to serve this community well. Next, I have the pleasure of also introducing Judge Ann Huang. Judge Huang earned her bachelor's degree from Cornell University and her law degree from the University of Southern California Law School. After beginning her career as a litigation associate at Irel in Manila in Los Angeles, Judge Huang would go on to serve for 12 years in the Federal Public Defender's Office in Los Angeles, the largest federal public defender's office in the nation. During her time there, she rose through the ranks from deputy public defender to chief deputy public defender and gained extensive federal trial experience. By 2018, her hard work had caught the eye of Governor Jerry Brown, who appointed her to serve on the Los Angeles County Superior Court. With her unique experience that comes from serving as a public defender, if confirmed, Judge Huang would bring a highly valuable perspective to the federal bench. And finally, I'm pleased to introduce Judge Cynthia Valenzuela, who is here today with her husband, Tim Dixon, and one of their two daughters. Now, a few years ago, you told Judge Valenzuela's grandmother that one day her granddaughter were serve, would serve on a U.S. federal court. She might not believe it. Her grandmother earned a living picking cotton and working at a tortilla factory in Arizona, a single mom working day in and day out to support her children to make ends meet. Yet she worked hard enough to allow her daughter, Judge Valenzuela's mother, to become the first person in her family to attend and graduate from college. Judge Valenzuela credits her parents with teaching her the value of education 
and the work ethic that would help her throughout her career. She earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Arizona before traveling west to earn her law degree from the UCLA School of Law. After graduating, she served as a special assistant to the vice chair of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and later as a trial attorney with the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division Voting Rights Section. Eventually, she would come home to Los Angeles to work in the U.S. Attorney's Office as a federal criminal prosecutor. In 2006, she became National Vice President of Litigation at the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund. By 2011, she left to become a supervising attorney for the Central District Criminal Justice Act panel. And finally, in 2016, the California Supreme Court appointed her to serve as a judge on the California State Bar Court handling attorney regulatory and discipline cases. Her academic credentials, legal qualifications, uh, and lived experience make her yet another outstanding nominee to serve the Central District. Now, Chair Durbin, as you know, this week we are celebrating the 200th federal judge confirmed under President Biden, and particularly the progress we've made in strengthening the federal judiciary. Over three years in, we have confirmed judges that reflect the tremendous and beautiful diversity of our nation. And for the first time in history, a majority of a president's confirmed judges are women. And they continue to come from diverse, a diverse range of communities, of academic backgrounds, and professions, but all more than eminently qualified. It's not lost on me that I've just had the opportunity to introduce three more women, all women of color and all extremely qualified to serve as federal judges. Each nominee would continue to build that historic record of diverse, accomplished, brilliant legal minds coming to the federal bench and would continue to restore trust among the American public. And for that reason, I hope my colleagues would join me in quickly advancing these nominations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like the uh, nominees to come to the table now for the questioning by senators. If you remain standing when you approach the table, we'll administer the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? Let the record reflect that all of the nominees have answered in the affirmative and are color coordinated. <laughs> With one possible exception. You know this personally, but for those who have any question about it, there's been an investigation of these five women from every angle, from the White House, the FBI, our staff, Republicans and Democrats looking through every aspect of their lives and record, public records. Among them, of course, most of you have been either prosecutors, public defenders, or both, or advocates for important organizations uh, that are involved in the law. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have that life experience. And you've seen a lot of cases. You've uh, poured your life into the system of justice in this country. And now you're looking for the, one of the major promotions, the federal judgeship for a lifetime appointment. So my experience as a small town lawyer in Illinois before being elected to the Senate was with a handful of federal judges. And we kind of figured out which ones leaned one way or leaned the other way. And some of them had their peculiarities as even senators have from time to time. So I'd just like to ask one general question as you reflect on the judges you've appeared before, if each of you would comment on the qualities that you think are most important in being a good judge that you would like to bring to the job. Judge Williams, you can start. We'll go across the board. Thank you, Senator. There are a lot of qualities that are very important uh, uh, to being a good judge. Uh, I am very, very honored to serve currently as a judge on the Los Angeles Superior Court and to be able to serve my community in that capacity 
every day, on and off the bench, I uh, strive to be deliberative, uh, to listen. I think good judges are good listeners uh, that are aware of the importance of, uh, of being able to listen to the litigants that are, uh, appear before them, not only to enable them to make the best decision in the case, but also to be able to articulate the reasons behind their decisions. I think the best judges are very, uh, they're uh, able to make decisions in a timely manner. Uh, the best judges have good judicial temperament uh, and are keenly aware of the importance of the decisions that they make uh, in the lives of the, uh, the litigants and the lawyers who appear before them. I think good senators have to be good listeners too and my staff just instructed me that I forgot to give you each an opportunity for an opening statement. <laughs> so we'll return to this question and after we give each of you five minutes, Judge Williams, you're first. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Chair Durbin, uh, Ranking Member Graham, and the members of the committee and its staff for holding this hearing today. I am profoundly grateful to President Biden for the honor of this nomination and to my home state senators, uh, Senators Butler and Padilla, for their support of my nomination and for their dedication to the people of the state of California. Senator Butler and Senator Padilla in absentia, thank you so much for the kind words of introduction this morning. I would not be here today uh, without the support of my husband, Jamie Court. Jamie has been my partner, my confidant, and an immense source of strength to me for 38 years. Cheering me on from home are our two sons who are finishing up their school terms and were not able to be with us here today. Words cannot express my gratitude to Jamie and to our sons for the amazing family that we've built together. Also here with me today is my brother-in-law, Andy Court, who traveled from New York to be here to support me today. I would also like to thank my, my sisters, Beverly Beachide and Maria Williams, Andy and my other siblings-in-law, Dan Beachide and Ronnie Verbin, and all of our nieces and nephews. All of them have traveled beside me on my professional journey with unwavering support. Finally, I would like to thank the dedicated judicial officers and staff of the judicial branch of the state of California including the judges, lawyers, and staff of the Judicial Council of California and its advisory committees, the lawyers and staff of the Center for Judicial Education and Research, and of course, the many dedicated judicial officers and staff of the Los Angeles Superior Court who work tirelessly to provide access to justice to the communities we serve. Senators, it is the honor of my career to be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Judge Court. Judge Wong. Thank you. I'd like to begin by thanking Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and members of the committee for considering my nomination. Thank you as well to Senators Butler and Padilla for your support and your kind introductions. And of course, I'd like to thank President Biden for the honor of this nomination. As I sit here before you today, I am humbled by the love and support of so many people who have brought me here. To my parents who immigrated to this great country from South Korea, who sacrificed so much so that my brother and I could realize the American dream, I am so grateful. Our parents taught us the value of hard work and a commitment to excellence, and I hope to make them proud. Thank you also to my brother for all of your friendship and support. To my husband and our daughter, your unconditional love and support keep me going every day. My husband has been my best friend and biggest supporter for over 20 years. Our amazing daughter teaches me something new every day. I'm so proud of you and grateful for you. To my, parents, my husband's parents, my in-laws, uh, his brother and sister, thank you for all of your encouragement and support over the years. To all my friends and my colleagues, I respect and admire the example you set and I could not be here without your support. Thank you also to my court staff who work every day at the highest level to serve the people of Los Angeles County. It has been a great honor to serve with them as a judge for the past five years. Thank you and I look forward to your questions for me. 
Thanks, Judge Wong. Judge Nedburn. Chair Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, members of the committee, I'd like to thank you for scheduling this hearing and permitting me to testify. I would like to thank President Biden for the confidence in me reflected by his nomination. I'm deeply appreciative to Majority Leader Schumer for recommending me to the President and for his kind words today. I'm also grateful for the support of Senator Gillibrand. I've been a United States Magistrate Judge for 12 years and currently serve as the Chief Magistrate Judge for the Southern District of New York. It is a true honor to serve the people of New York in this capacity. If confirmed, I would accept the additional responsibilities of a district judge with humility, seriousness, and allegiance to the law. I'd like to thank my court family and friends who have supported me in this process. I joined the court in 2010 as its first chief counsel to the Office of Pro Se Litigation. I have learned so many important lessons from the hardworking people who have dedicated their careers to the administration of justice. Our court is staffed with incredibly dedicated public servants and judges who work at the highest level. I have had more than 25 law clerks and three courtroom deputies. Several of my law clerks and deputies are here today and I am grateful for their support. In many ways, my path to this nomination was paved by their hard work and commitment to the rule of law. I'd like to thank my friends for their support, many of whom are home watching. Finally, I'd like to thank my family. My parents couldn't be here today because they are traveling to Montana to celebrate my oldest nephew's high school graduation. I am, however, grateful for their decades of support. My amazing children are here today. You are both the most important people in my life, and I am proud to be your mom. And of course, my husband, John, is here. I am lucky to have in my life partner a lawyer who has also committed his career to public service and excellence. Thank you all for your support and encouragement. Ms. Newman. Thank you, Chair Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and the members of this committee for holding this hearing today. I am humbled to be here this morning. Receiving this nomination has been the honor of my career. I would like to thank President Biden for nominating me and my home state senators Collins and King for allowing my nomination process to proceed. And I would like to thank Senator King for his very kind words this morning. I am truly grateful. I am blessed with an abundance of supportive family and friends, many of whom are here today. I would like to start by thanking four of the most remarkable people to me in this room, my four children. And they are missing lacrosse and baseball games, which are very important to them to be here for me. So I really appreciate that. Rosa is 15 and a freshman in high school. Nico is 13 and in seventh grade. Enzo is 11 and in fifth grade. And our beloved tornado, Coco, is two. Kids, I'm so proud to be here, but nothing on earth makes me prouder than the four of you. It is truly my honor to be your chauffeur. Oh, I mean your mother. <laughs> To my father, Peter Newman, who is also here, my dad served our country in the Army during the Vietnam War. He then dedicated his career to public service, working in the Social Security Administration for over 30 years until he retired. There, he met my stepmother, Maria, who is joining us from afar, who also worked for the Social Security Administration for nearly 40 years. They have instilled in me the importance of public service. My mother, Diane Newman, is here as well. A force to be reckoned with always, my mom began her own business in this then very unusual field called mediation back in the 1980s. She put herself through law school while growing the field in her practice, taking courses in the evening, and graduating when I was in eighth grade. It is through her that I got my capacity for perseverance and love of the law. My other stepmother, Shelley Cullen, is also here. Shelley has taught me many things, but most importantly, to always look for joy in the world. My brother Brian is here in person as well, which means so much to me. My sister Jane and brother Michael, as well as brother-in-law Aaron, along with their spouses and wonderful children, are supporting me from home. My in-laws, Richard and Anita Perlett, are here behind me, as well as other family and friends. And I have saved the most precious for last, my husband Noah. Noah is a professor of ornithology who drove down here in, from Maine in the minivan with the four kids alone and is heading back up again this afternoon. Noah, please let me know if you want me to record my voice saying, don't make me stop this car. <laughs> Noah, you are a true partner in every sense of the word. I would not be here without you by my side. 
Thank you to all my friends and family for supporting me. I'm truly blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Valenzuela, Dixon. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and distinguished members of the committee for your time and your consideration. Thank you to President Biden for the honor of this nomination. Many thanks to Senator Padilla for his recommendation and kind introduction this morning, and to Senator Butler for her support. It would be an honor to return to the federal government and specifically in service to the Central District of California where I served as a federal prosecutor, this time in the position of United States Judge. With me here today is my husband, Tim, who, like me, came from humble beginnings and dedicated his career to our great country. He served in the military and later as a career FBI special agent. And also with me is one of my two precious daughters, our other daughter is back home in school. My girls are my greatest blessing. I would like to thank my family, my parents, Absalom and Naomi, who overcame poverty and reached the highest levels of educational attainment, and who impressed upon me the value of education and hard work. My dad put his life on the line as a firefighter in Tucson, Arizona, and my mom was a dedicated public school teacher. Thanks to my siblings, Patty, Alice, and Absalom for taking good care of their little sister, and a special salute to my brother for his many years of military service. I would like to acknowledge my sister-in-law, Melanie, my brothers-in-law, and all of my nieces and nephews. My uncle, Joel, another military veteran, and the first lawyer in the family, my Aunt Irene, and all my many aunts, uncles, and cousins. As a judge on the California State Bar Court for the past eight years, I have been fortunate to work with people of exceptional integrity, professionalism, and dedication to protecting the public and maintaining the highest professional standards, and I am grateful to them. I want to thank all of the many people who have supported and encouraged me and who are praying for me and cheering me on today, including dear friends, former colleagues, classmates, and wonderful neighbors. And finally, I'm so grateful for my many amazing mentors, including John Trasvina, Ambassador Carlos Moreno, Rebecca Wirtz, Lawrence Middleton, Rebecca Lonergan, Kathy Purcell, Rich Hahn, and district judges, Jim Otero, Dale Fisher, and Fernando Olguin. Thank you so much, and I welcome the committee's questions. Thank you, Judge. What an extraordinary resume you bring to this uh, committee room, each of you. Mm -hmm. Backgrounds in prosecution and defense and civil litigation, uh, serving on the bench yourselves before you, uh, you seek this opportunity on the federal bench. Uh, Judge Valenzuela, is it proper to call you Judge Valenzuela or Judge Dixon? Judge Valenzuela, please. Is that good? Okay. Thank I you. want to make sure I get that right. Yours is unusual among the nominees in that you worked for about five years for MALDEF. Uh, am I correct? Is that part of your background? Yes, Senator. It's an organization which I greatly respect, but brings some controversy to issues. Speak to the issue from your personal and family experience of access to education and what it meant in your years with MALDEF. Yes, thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, I am the benefici beneficiary of a desegregation consent decree. Um, the state of Arizona, where I'm originally from, um, intentionally segregated its uh, public school students at one point in the early 1900s. Um, to remedy that, uh, the vestiges of past discrimination, um, MALDEF brought a lawsuit, and um, I am a beneficiary of the consent decree that resulted from that lawsuit. So uh, as a result of the consent decree, I was bused from my working class neighborhood uh, across the city to the city center, 
um, and went to middle school and high school uh, directly across the street from the University of Arizona. And as a result of um, going to those middle schools and high schools, uh, I believe that I benefited from a uh, rich diversity of students um, at those schools, um, uh, greater academic opportunities, and um, overall just uh, a, a better education uh, that really, I think, led to my uh, success. Were any members of your family attending those segregated schools? All three of my older siblings attended the segregated schools. I see. I'm going to withhold questions to the end and let, recognize my colleagues because I know they have other issues they face in their scheduling. Judge uh, Senator Graham. Thank you, uh, Judge Venezuela. Yes. Um, uh, about your work with the uh, national, you were the national vice president and director of litigation of the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund from 2006 to 11. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, were you there when this organization opposed Miguel Estrada for the D.C. Circuit, or was that before? I don't recall that happening okay. during my tenure. Okay. Um, you were counsel in cases uh, Mart Martinez versus Regent of the University of California, uh, arguing that illegal immigrants should be given in-state tuition. Is that correct? Um, that was the issue in that case, correct? Yeah. And you oppose non-resident U.S. citizens being given that status, is that correct? I don't think we opposed non-resident citizens getting that uh, benefit. Okay. In uh, Chamber of Commerce versus Whitting, Whitting you oppose the E-Verify system to identify a person's uh, immigration status in Arizona, is that correct? In all of the immigration cases that MALDEF brought at that time, Senator, what MALDEF was litigating was the issue of whether the states had the authority to um, regulate immigration law. And our argument was that states and local jurisdictions do not, that, that only Congress has the right to regulate immigration. So it was just about the role of the state versus Congress, right? Um, it was about preemption. Okay. So uh, in San Francisco, Coral Construction versus San Francisco, you, or, you argued in support of a San Francisco contracting scheme, which granted a 5 to 10% discount on bids received by minority and women-owned businesses for contracting projects. Is that correct? Senator, I know that I listed that case on the SJQ. I don't think I signed that brief. Um, I, I don't recall the issues in that case. <clears throat> um, you don't remember that case? I, I don't. Okay. Uh, were you involved in Ritchie versus De Stanifo, D E S T E F A N O, where you argued in favor of bending written exams for firefighters that produced a disparate impact on minority candidates? Again, that case was. I think the MALDEF did file an amicus brief in that case, if I remember correctly, um, but I did not sign the brief as far as well, I remember. Do you agree with that idea? That, what idea? The, the organization that you're a member of apparently provided an amicus brief in this litigation, is that correct? Yes. Okay, do you agree with the position stated in the amicus brief that you shouldn't have written exams for firefighters? Um. That's all right. Uh, have you heard of um, California Immigrant Youth Justice Alliance? No. You never heard of that? No. As, as, that's not a program that Maldif is involved in houses and supports, You've never heard of it? I don't, I don't know what MALDEF does now. I haven't been there for 13 okay. years, 15 well, been, years. This has been around for a while. So you don't know anything about it? I don't. It says, well, their manifesto is to abolish ICE. Are you for abolishing ICE? No, Senator. Okay. And it says that all immigrant policies are deeply rooted in white nationalism. You don't agree with that, right? No, Senator. Do you think that we're 
supporting the occupation of Palestine, the United States? Um, I mean, this is the manifesto of this group. I, I, I would not agree with that statement. Okay, so. all right. But, but you don't know anything about this, I guess, is your testimony, right? I don't. Okay. That's Fair correct. Enough. Okay. Um, uh, Judge uh, Netburn, is that right? Yes, sir. Tell us about a case you had, I think, involving, um, get my facts right, the transfer of a person, a female, who, a uh, male who became biological male. Does this ring a bell? Uh, yes, I, I know which case you're referring okay. to. It was a habeas petition. Yeah, and uh, it was somebody who had been convicted in 94 for uh, raping a child and uh, a male child and raping a 17-year-old female. They served their sentence. They got out. They were sentenced, uh, convicted of distributing child pornography. The biological male transitioned into being a female, and the Bureau of Prisons objected to the person going into the female system. Do you remember all that? I do, Senator. Okay. And you basically ruled in favor of the petitioner, saying that the Bureau of Prisons' concerns about the intimidation and the threat to fe female in inmates was theoretical. Is that right? Thank you, Senator. In that habeas petition, I issued a report and recommendation which was based on the facts that were presented to me. Those facts included statements from the three wardens who supervised this petitioner, all three of whom recommended that the petitioner be transferred to a women's facility because right. of her serious medical needs. And well, the, Bureau the, Bureau, of Prisons, the Bureau of Prisons opposed this transfer, right? Well, the wardens who were directly No, 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 the Bureau of Prisons opposed this transfer, right? Correct, which is why the petitioner brought a habeas petition. Right, so now I'm over time, but I'll wrap it up. The bottom line here is that the concern of the Bureau of Prisons is that a biological male transitioning to a female with a history of sexual violence would be intimidating and threatening to the <clears throat> female population. You thought that to be a theoretical concern because the person in question had attacked male and female people. Is that right? That, that's not correct, sir. Well, that's I what you said. I based my report and recommendation on the record ev evidence before me. So you think the concerns of the Bureau of Prison that someone with a violent past regarding sexual assaults uh, would not be threatening and intimidating a biological male transitioning to female. You just don't believe that's a legitimate concern? Let, let me be very clear, sir. The crimes for which the petitioner was convicted of 30 years ago are abhorrent, and the petitioner was convicted by an Indiana state court uh, well, and sentenced. Well, he was convicted, he, she was convicted of assaulting a child, raping a 17-year-old woman, got out of prison and was convicted of child pornography afterwards, transitioned from a male to a female, and the Bureau of Prison said, we do not believe this person should be in a female prison, and you thought those concerns were theoretical. Is that fair? I based my decision on the record before me. You want to finish your statement? Thank you, Chair Durbin. I based my decision on the record before me. In, the record was that... Uh, the three wardens who had supervised the petitioner all recommended transfer. The petitioner had had no disciplinary issues at all during her time in federal custody. She had never engaged in any violence and, in fact, had been the victim of sexual violence while in a male facility. And the Bureau of Prisons' longtime treating uh, medical provider also testified during a two-day hearing before me who recommended that the petitioner be transferred because of her serious medical needs. I recommended that the district judge adopt my recommendation based on Estelle versus Gamble and Turner versus Safley. The district judge adopted my report and recommendation and the government did not move for a stay. Thank you. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> 
I am very delighted to see a panel of all female nominees. I also want to congratulate and thank the chairman for uh, the uh, leadership that he has provided in uh, dealing with all of the nominees. And today is a very especially important day as we um, uh, confirm the 200th judge, many of whom are, are women um, and representing minority um, communities. So uh, to ensure the fitness of nominees, I ask each nominee, and we'll start with uh, Judge Court and go right down the line, uh, the uh, following two initial questions. Since you became a legal adult, have you ever made unwanted requests for sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or assault of a sexual nature? No, Senator. No, Senator. No, Senator. No, Senator. No, Senator. Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement related to this kind of conduct? No, Senator. No, Senator. No, Senator. No, Senator. No, Senator. Thank you. Uh, Judge Wang, I note that uh, your parents are immigrants from South Korea. Uh, and so could you uh, tell us a little bit about what it was like for you to uh, grow up um, as I am well, I realize where you live, there are a number of South Koreans, but what it was like to um, uh, grow up with immigrant parents and, and the challenges faced and how that prepares you to be a, a district court judge. Thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, there is a very large uh, Korean population in Los Angeles. However, the schools that I attended um, when I was a child, um, I was either the only or one of uh, very few number of Korean students. Um, and so um, it was um, uh, a challenging experience, but my parents also emphasized our rich um, cultural um, heritage. Um, and so it has been uh, important uh, for me um, in honoring um, both their contributions and their sacrifices in this country um, um, to ensure uh, that um, that I always um, remember and and um, and uphold uh, their traditions and their culture. Uh, can you uh, extend my aloha to your parents? I know that they are not with us. They're watching from home. Yes, thank so you very uh, much. Aloha to them. Oh, Judge Valencia, uh, Valencia, sorry, um, Valenzuela. Uh, uh, it's very clear to me that education has been a, a, a foundational um, foundational for you and your family. Can you just talk a little bit more about how important it was for you to be bused to a whole another school from where you lived and what that experience inculcated in you or taught you? Thank you for the question, Senator. Um, Seeing it through the through a child's eyes, I was um, unhappy with the fact that I wasn't going to be going to the same schools as my three older siblings. Um, but I, I saw very quickly, as far as you know, a twelve-year-old can process uh, that where why for whatever reason this change was happening, um, it was a good change and. Um, I think just being physically located, both my middle school and high school directly across the street from the University of Arizona, was just a daily reminder that I could go to college. Um, my siblings did not uh, go to college. One of them later went back, but they did not go to college after high school. Um, so just seeing the University of Arizona every day inspired me to work towards going to the University of Arizona, and then we had professors from the University of Arizona who actually came to our high school and taught some of the high school classes. And so I think just that connection to opportunity was um, an incredible benefit to me. I uh, very much agree with you. Uh, the exposure uh, to uh, higher education and those kinds of experiences are very meaningful. Uh, Judge Court, I, um, I assume that you consider diversity on the court to be a, a very important Yes? I do. So. Can you talk a little bit more about why? 
Diversity on the court and diversity in the judici judiciary is very important for a number of reasons. Uh, I think that it, it's, it goes a long way toward uh, engendering trust in the judiciary when, when litigants and lawyers come to court and they see a diverse uh, judiciary. I think it sends a message, especially in a community like Los Angeles that is so uh, diverse with so many people who come from so many different places. It sends a signal that everyone has a chance of being um, treated equally because the, uh, the, the demographics of the court reflect the demographics of the community uh, in which it serves. Also, I think it's very important in terms of mentoring future professionals uh, to come into the, uh, the judicial profession. Uh, I participate on a regular basis on, in a couple of programs that the Los Angeles Superior Court uh, operates in, in conjunction with some bar groups, including a program called the Power Lunch. And that is a lunch where we have judges, court reporters, bailiffs, uh, interpreters, judicial assistants come and make presentations to groups of high school and middle school students who come on a field trip to the court to learn about the different uh, uh, career paths that there are in the justice system. And I think that's very important in terms of ensuring the future of, of the integrity of the judicial system. Thank you, Senator Hirono. Thank you for letting her finish her um, answer. Thank you. Senator and Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to follow up with Judge Nett Byrne regarding uh, the JJS case. I've been reading through your report and recommendation, and I, I just want to review the fact that this was, um, this was an individual, JJS, who had raped a nine-year-old boy, raped a 17-year-old girl, was put in prison, went to prison for a long time. Uh, after uh, that person was paroled, JJS, uh, the way you put it on page 44 of the report and recommendation was that he, um, uh, the, the JJS sent two sexually explicit images of minors um, in 2015 while out on parole. I, I, I should point out this is kind of a euphemistic reference. These were not just sexually explicit images. These were sexually explicit images of adults violently molesting children, sexually assaulting, abusing children violently. Uh, it, every time this person has had an opportunity to offend, this person has offended. And yet you recommended this person against the recommendation of the U.S. Bureau of Prisons to go to a women's facility. Now, your reasoning here is stunning to me. Uh, going back again to page 44 of your report and recommendation, you, says, you, you, you say, quote, there are no signs that petitioner is a is at risk of reoffending. I'm struggling to understand how you could possibly conclude that. Because the minute this person was released, this person engaged in other offenses. Yes, not a contact offense while out on parole. But there are still issues going on. It also it says nothing. You don't adequately grapple with the obvious fact that this is a six foot two biological male. Yes, uh, uh, transition aside, the, tr the transition didn't begin until age 51 or 52. By then, JJS had acquired all of the physical, biological uh, size and strength advantages of being male. Those don't go away because there is a transition. On what planet does it make sense? On what planet does that person with that sexual offense history, with being biologically male and also six foot two, not pose a threat to the safety of female inmates. I don't understand how you could conclude that this person shows no risk of being an offender. Now, you, you, you argue at one point that this person has shown no pattern or history of offending while in prison. Yeah, because JJS was in prison with a bunch of other men where the size and strength differentials uh, uh, aren't quite the same. Can you help me understand this? Thank you, Senator. First, the crimes for which the petitioner was convicted are horrific. I've been a sitting United States magistrate judge for 12 years. Sexual offenses against children are among the worst crimes that we see. This person was convicted by guilty plea 30 years ago of two awful crimes. 
and was sentenced to a very significant prison sentence by the state court judge. About eight years ago, the petitioner committed another awful crime, the crime of distribution of child pornography. That is an abhorrent crime, and there are real victims. And the petitioner was sentenced by the Indiana federal well, I, court. I, I understand this. This is, this is all undisputed. What I want to know is why is it okay? Why is it safe? Why is it fair to female inmates to send this person to a female prison? This is a guy who raped a 17-year-old girl and a 9-year-old boy. Why is that safe? Six foot two biological male. Senator Lee, as I do in every case before me, I look at the record evidence. I consider the facts before me. In this case, the facts that I considered included that every single warden who supervised this petitioner recommended that the petitioner be transferred to a women's facility because of her serious medical needs, because she had engaged in no violence, no infractions, and in fact had been the victim of sexual assault. And While harassment. in a male prison, and this was against the, uh, the, the decision of the U.S. Bureau of Prisons. Judge Valenzuela Dixon, do photo, photo ID laws violate the U.S. Constitution? Does it violate the U.S. Constitution to require someone to show identification when casting a vote? Does it violate the U.S. Constitution? Is it unconstitutional? Um, Please turn on your microphone. I, Thank you. I, I, I Thank ask you because sense. you submitted a brief in a case called Crawford versus Marion yes. County Election uh, Board. And, and, and in your brief, you argued, quote, the striking similarities between voter identification laws and poll taxes this court rejected less than a half century ago demonstrate that identification requirements are unconstitutional regardless of the level of scrutiny the court applies. It disagree, the court, of course, uh, disagreed with your assessment. It did. So what's your, what's your answer to my question? The, the Crawford case made it clear that voter identification laws are constitutional, and I would follow that precedent. Do you agree with that precedent? That yes. photo ID laws are constitutional? Yes. I do, Senator. And yet you argued to the contrary in that case. Um, did the court convince you? Well, the, the court stated what the law is, so I would follow the precedent of the Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, judge Wong, uh, I'd love to just start with you. Um, you've been a judge for the Los Angeles Superior Court since 2019. Prior to joining the bench, you served as chief deputy public defender in the Central District of California in Los Angeles. For, uh, since, I think, beginning in 2006, is that correct? Um, my time at the Federal Public Defender's Office began then. My roles changed throughout my time there. Of course. Uh, can, you, um, can you share with, uh, with the committee how the, you've been, these experiences has prepared you uh, for the federal bench? So um, in my 16 years as an attorney, working both in civil cases and criminal cases, um, one of the most important lessons that I took from that, those experiences was the need for clients to understand the court process, the cases, and to understand why um, decisions were being made, and particularly in the criminal context for defendants to understand the consequences of their actions. Um, it, it helps, I think, to ensure that people don't come back into the system. And so um, now that I've been a judge for five years, I took from that experience the need for clear um, decisions that explain to the litigants why I'm ruling as I am. Um, it helps uh, litigants understand that their arguments have been understood by the court and for them to feel that they've had their day in court. Thank you. I think we all would agree that those are incredibly uh, important qualities and skills uh, necessary for uh, federal service. Uh, Judge Court, um, I talked about in my introduction of our California judges the incredible caseload um, that if you were confirmed would be in front uh, of you in the central district given its uh, size, the uh, amount of time that the vacancies uh, have existed and just the um, uh, volume um, that, that generates from serving 17 million uh, people. What do you believe 
are the biggest challenges that you would face in transitioning to the federal bench, preparing for um, that kind of caseload? So the, what do you believe are the challenges and what is your, would be your plan uh, in preparation for your transition to ins ensure a smooth one and the continued effective execution of justice for Californians? Thank you, Senator. Uh, in my time, in my 12 years on the bench, I've learned a lot of lessons, and I have been uh, very fortunate to have been appointed by all of the last three chief justices of the California Supreme Court to Judicial Council advisory committees, um, and I currently serve as a member of the Judicial Council itself. I also uh, am currently the supervising judge of the civil division, which is experiencing the same caseload and filing issues that are being faced by the Central District of California currently. I'm also an elected member of the American Law Institute, and I serve as a member of the members consultative group for high volume litigation. So I have been um, steeped in not only the day to day of managing large caseloads, increased filings, uh, but have also been involved in policy and research uh, concerning ways that we can address uh, the increasing caseloads using technology and other resources uh, in a way that preserves access to justice for, uh, for the people who come to the court for redress. I uh, have every intention of continuing the work that I do in this area because I think it's, it's mission critical to the work that the branch does in order to be responsive to the ever increasing caseloads uh, that, that uh, all courts, frankly, across the country are facing. Thank you, uh, Judge Court. I think I wanted to just note the absence of Chair Durbin, who has handed me the gavel. Um, and so I uh, appreciate the, the response. I want to then turn to Senator Kennedy uh, for his questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Judge Dixon, can you tell me about the full faith and credit clause of the Constitution? It, it's me, Senator Kennedy, Judge Valenzuela. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I can't see that far. Okay. I just got new glasses. <laughs> judge, judge down here, and then we'll come this way. Judge Court. Uh, Senator, I had the same issue when I walked into the room. I thought that, that it would be difficult to see my last name, so no need to apologize. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, and I apologize, your question is the, 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 the full, full faith, faith and credit, credit clause, yes, clause of the Constitution. Uh, it uh, requires that the uh, states give full faith and credit to judgments of other states. Okay, very good. Um, Judge Netburn, I, I was looking at your, your resume. You, uh, you went to Brown University, is that right? I did. And then you went to law school in California? That's correct. And you've worked for the Brennan Center? I, inter I interned. Brennan I was a law student Justice. intern. Okay. And you worked for the Center for Reproductive Law and Policy? I was a law student intern there for eight weeks during my 1L summer. Okay. And you are a political activist, aren't you? I am not. I'm a sitting United States magistrate judge. Okay. All right. Um, do you remember an inmate named William McLean, also known as July Justine Shelby? Yes, I know who you're referring to. Okay. Uh, Mr. McLean uh, raped a child, didn't he? 30 years ago, the petitioner in the habeas case before me... Did, did, did he rape a child? He, he pled guilty to that crime. Yes, it's abhorrent. And then he, and then he raped a 17... He, he raped a little boy, right? I believe that's correct. I believe he pled guilty to two acts he, of sexual and he, violence. And then he raped a 17-year-old girl, right? Again, th this case was handled by the state court in Indiana, but I I'm believe... I'm just he, asking you the facts. I don't, believe... Don't, don't stall on me now. Uh, did he rape a 17-year-old girl or not I, after raping a 9-year-old boy? I believe that's what he pled guilty to. Okay, and then he went to prison, didn't he? Yes. The petition and, then, was and then he came out and he sent child porn, basically adults raping little children to another sex offender. 
and he was sent back to prison, right? The petitioner pled guilty to was one- Was he sent back to prison? Well, that case was in the federal system, so- Was he sent back to prison? Yes, this time to okay. federal prison. Thank you. And then he decided to, to transition, and he became a female and started going by July Justine Shelby. Is that right? Yes. And um, Ms. Shelby said, I don't want to go to a male prison. I want to go to a female prison. And the board of prisons said, what planet did you parachute in from? You're going to a male prison with this kind of record. And you sent him to a female prison, didn't you? You said that the board of prisons was trying to violate Ms. Shelby, former Mr. McLean's constitutional rights, didn't you? I issued a report and recommendation to the district judge recommending that the district judge transfer the petitioner to a women's facility. The district you, judge you adopted said that, that the recommendation. The board of prisons was trying to violate Ms. Shelby's Mr. McLean's constitutional rights, didn't you? So I based my decision on the facts that were presented to me in the record. But, but it wasn't that your ruling? I, I recommended finding that under Estelle versus Gamble. Why won't you admit that was your ruling? Are you ashamed I, of it? Today? I'm not. I'm answering the question. I applied Estelle versus but Gamble. was that your ruling? My recommendation was that the petitioner's serious medical needs were being denied by keeping her in a men's facility. A violation of the Eighth Amendment, right? That's correct. Okay. And and how, how big was, was Ms. Shelby, Mr. McLean? I don't have a specific recollection. Your colleague just suggested that she was six more than feet? six feet tall. And, and you told the Board of Prisons, well, she, she'll be okay. The, the other women in the female prison will be okay because, because it's only hypothetical that Ms. Shelby, Ms. M Mr. McLean, would reoffend again after he's already raped a nine-year-old boy and a 17-year-old girl and has been sending child porn through the mail. You said there's no chance he'll reoffend again. Did you did you say that, Senator Kennedy? I based my decision on the record. But, but am I right? Did you say, did you conclude that? I don't have a specific recollection of that. I I did recommend that uh, after finding a constitutional what, what, violation. What were you thinking in, in in saying there's no? It's only hypothetical that he, that she would reoffend. The facts of the case were that the petitioner had last engaged in a contact offense 30 years ago. The petitioner had not engaged in any contact offense. In addition, the medical evidence made clear that for the last five years, the petitioner was sober and hormonally entirely a female, and there was no well, the evidence. The Board of Prisons didn't agree with you. Let me, let me, I'm not going to run out of time here. You're really a political activist, aren't you? I am not, sir. But your record demonstrates otherwise. I disagree. I apply the law to the facts and come to a fair decision. All of my decisions that have been appealed, particularly this one, the district judge adopted my report and recommendation in full, and the government did not move for a stay of the decision. Well, Judge Detburn, I want to continue on this line of questioning. In your court, what matters more, the rights of individuals or your po political ideology? I apply the law to the facts. I, I asked a question, case. which matters more? Well, my political ideology doesn't matter at all. Okay, so I don't believe you. And I think this case demonstrates that you are willing to subjugate the rights of individuals to satisfy your political ideology. This case involves a male defendant who raped a nine-year-old boy. Was he guilty of that? Yes, the petitioner pled guilty to that. Okay, so he raped a nine-year-old boy. He also raped a 17-year-old girl. Was he guilty of that? He pled guilty, the petitioner pled guilty to that crime as well. So was he guilty? I, I hope so, because she pled guilty to it. Uh, he was a he when he did this. That's correct. And also criminal devi deviant conduct, which the record doesn't, doesn't uh, disclose what that was exactly. Then, after serving in prison, Mr. McLean was released for parole 
but then violated the terms of parole by having internet and was sent back to prison. One year after being released again, he was convicted of having child pornography. Is that correct? I'm, I'm unclear on exactly the time frame that you're at, but, but the petitioner was convicted of distributing child pornography. Child pornography that, w that was images of adults violently raping children. Abhorrent conduct. Okay. For which there are real victims. And this individual, six foot two, biologically a man, a minute ago you said that when this man decided that he was a she, you, 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 you said this individual was, quote, I wrote it down, sober and entirely a female. That phrase struck me as, as, as remarkable. Did this individual have male genitalia? I, I think what I said, or at least what it, I... It, it, that is a verbatim quote, entirely a female. Sorry, what I meant to say was hormonally a female. Okay, but that's not entirely. Did this individual have male genitalia? Yes. So you took a six-foot-two serial rapist, serial child rapist, with male genitalia, and he said, you know, I'd like to be in a women's prison. And your answer was, that sounds great to me. Let me ask you something. The other women in that prison, do they have any rights? Is, is that a question you Yes, me? the other women in that prison, do they have any rights? Of course. Do they have the right not to have a six foot two man who is a repeat serial rapist put in as their cellmate? Senator Cruz, I considered the facts presented to me and I reached a decision. I asked based you a question. I asked is. you a question. Do they have a right not to have a six foot two man who is a serial rapist put in as their cellmate? Do those women have a right to that? Every person who's incarcerated has the right to be safe in their space. But you didn't think so. You, you didn't think so. And in fact, I'm going to give some quotes from your order because Senator Kennedy is right. This is not a judge's order. This is a political activist. By the way, the beginning of your order be, uh, says, at birth, people are typically assigned a gender. I got to say that would astonish a lot of Americans. A lot of Americans think you, you, you go to the hospital, a baby is born, and you congratulations, you have a little boy, a little girl. The assigned a gender, I know you went to Brown, but it sounds like it's in a college faculty lounge with no bearing on reality. The Bureau of Prison argued what I'm saying right now, that if you put this person in a female prison, there will be a risk of sexual assault to the women. And you know what you did? You said you didn't care about the women. I'm going to quote what you wrote. You wrote, quote, the Bureau of Prisons claim penological interest in protecting female prisoners from sexual violence and trauma. This interest is legitimate. That's kind of you to say. But there are no signs that petitioner is at risk of reoffending. The record is devoid of evidence of incidents of violence or assault during petitioner's incarceration when she was the perpetrator, only the victim. A theoretical risk of sexual assault by the prisoner without more cannot support the BOP's position. No evidence, theoretical. H have you dealt, in what universe is someone who is a serial repeat child rapist not at a risk of reoffending? Senator, as I do in every case. Okay, I, I know you've been told to repeat the line, I follow the law. I asked a question. In what universe is someone who is a serial repeat child rapist not at risk of reoffending? Sir, I looked at the facts that were before me in this case. All of the evidence, including the statements of every warden who had supervised this petitioner. You, you also wrote, the BOP also posits that permitting pet petitioner to live among women will be traumatizing and possibly dangerous to them. This concern is overblown. I have to say, if I were the father of one of those women, and you decided that my daughter's cellmate was going to be a six foot two man who over and over and over again committed violent sexual assault. I would say the entire justice system is absurd and it is clear on your record your political ideology matters a heck of a lot more than the rights of those women that you endangered. I think you're a radical and I think you have no business being a judge. Judge Nettburn, there was um, an opportunity during your exchange with Senator Cruz that you were attempting to offer uh, um, a response relative to 
uh, the, con the conditions under which um, this uh, petitioner um, were, was unsafe in the facilities uh, in which she was being held. I'd like to offer you the opportunity to finish that response. So the facts that were presented to me and what I relied on to make my decision were that the petitioner had engaged in no violence, no physical violence, no acts of sexual violence whatsoever while in custody. All three wardens who supervised the petitioner requested that she be transferred to a women's facility because of her serious medical needs. In addition, the Bureau of Prisons longtime medical provider testified at a two-day hearing in my courtroom and recommended that the petitioner be transferred because of her serious medical needs. And the last thing I'll say is that the Transgender Executive Council, which is the body that makes decisions on behalf of transgender transfer requests within the Bureau of Prisons, never said that the petitioner could not be transferred and never ever said that she couldn't be transferred because of any risk of violence. What the Transgender Executive Council repeatedly said in denying the request was simply that she needed to maintain her hormone levels. That was the repeated um, justification for the denial of transfer. But the petitioner had reached full female hormone levels before even being incarcerated. At the time, the district judge in Indiana who sentenced the petitioner requested that she be placed in a women's facility. Her hormones were entirely female at that point, and so the decision by the Transgender Executive Council to deny the transfer request based on this idea that it was only because her hormones needed to be consistent and stabilized, I found was a pretext, but they never once said she cannot be transferred because of violence. It was always based on this idea that her hormones had well, to be transferred. Thank you, Judge Nettburn. Senator Padilla. Senator Padilla, that's Senator directly Padilla. contrary Senator, to what Senator, you said. all have that had is directly all, contrary. No, 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 and she just directly contradicted her own report. I'm just going to read her own words just said because fair, it's exactly Madam the opposite of what she said. Your That's own report. Senators, Senators I, I gave both of you more time you, to finish your you line of questioning. Yeah, you I in. allowed the witness to finish her. I allowed the witness to finish her response. I allowed the witness to finish her response. That is, okay, I understand that, that you're is scared not of the I have status to share. Senator Padilla. You Madam Chair, open up Madam testimony Chair. she, and then she has an obligation to explain to why she directly contradicted what she wrote in her report. She says in her report, the Bureau of Prisons' claimed penological interest is in protecting female prisoners from sexual violence and trauma. She just told you the Bureau of Prisons didn't say there was a concern about sexual violence and trauma. Those are directly contradictory, and why are you contradicting what you wrote in your report? And what are you Senator, trying to hide? I believe, Senator Senator Padilla. Padilla. No, wait, point of I order. Believe Senator Padilla. Point of order. What Senator are Padilla. Are, are you going to let her answer that question? Senator you, Padilla. You don't want her to answer that question. Senator You're Padilla. Afraid? Very this much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Madam Senator Are you afraid Padilla. of the answer this to that question? No cover up. Are Senator you Padilla. afraid of the answer to that question? Senator Holy Padilla. So yes, my you are afraid of the answer this to that question. Ridiculous. Senator Padilla. Please Clearly you're time. afraid of the answer to that question. This is Thank absurd. To the uh, nominees before us, appreciate your patience and uh, your dignity. Um, I would like to expand on a topic that uh, I raised in my introductions to the nominees from California, and that's the value, not just the importance, but the value of diversity in our judiciary. Clearly, you each bring a tremendous both life as well as professional experience, which I think uh, strengthens the judiciary uh, when more perspectives are considered in the deliberations. So I want to extend it further because it's not just the, the thoughts and experiences that you bring to the table. I think it also uh, has tremendous value when the public uh, views the judiciary. When decisions are made, uh, sometimes you know, for, for the, the uh, prosecution side, sometimes for the defense side, knowing that people are seen, knowing that people are heard, adds to the public confidence in the decisions uh, and in the results of the process. But going one step further, it's not just those who sit on the bench 
that uh, are important in this process. I know everybody who sits on the bench relies on law clerks. And I think you can each speak to an experience you've had as a clerk and what that uh, quality clerkship experience did for you. The, the opportunity to serve as a law clerk is oftentimes a launching pad for a successful career in the legal profession, whether it's the public sector or in the private sector. Yet statistics show that quality clerkship opportunities and experiences uh, often leave out equally qualified young lawyers of color. Um, and so my question is, do you agree with the premise that more diversity is better for the judiciary? Uh, if not, I'd be interested in hearing why. Uh, if you do agree, then what would you do if you're fortunate enough to be confirmed to pursue increasing diversity in your courtroom, starting with the judge court? Thank you, Senator. I do agree with uh, the premise of your question. Uh, and. One of the things that I do now is I do outreach in, um, to the traditional places, law schools, uh, uh, things of that nature, but also I look for opportunities to mentor and opportunities to do non-traditional outreach because of the fact that it is my experience that uh, there are some uh, very talented people who might be interested in entering the pipeline either into the law or into the judiciary that self-select out because either they don't see themselves in that, that space uh, or uh, because the opportunities are, have, don't present themselves to them. Uh, so I would uh, continue to do the work that I do to make sure that the outreach I do is uh, very expansive and ex inclusive. Thank you. Judge Wong. Thank you. Um, I agree that diversity is very important. Um, as a judge, I think it's important to cast a wide net in interviewing um, uh, potential law clerks. And as a sitting judge, um, what I have done in addition is talk to law students also about externing and the value of um, externing as well as clerking. Um, and so I've given um, talks at various law schools and with law students about um, uh, the value um, in one's career, but also in the experience of being able to um, see the courts in action um, and for um, people to seek out these opportunities. Thank you. Judge Shepard. Thank you, Senator Padilla. I, I agree with your value statement and I agree with the comments of my colleagues. I'll just say that one of the things that I have done as a judge looking for law clerks is to look not just at the sort of traditional elite law schools that tend to be feeders to the federal clerkship path, but to look for very high performing students at other law schools. I've also had great success um, hiring law clerks who came to the law after um, prior careers. I had a law clerk who was a chef I had a law clerk who was an artist. I had a law clerk who was a minister. And I think bringing in that diversity of life experiences also was valuable. Thank you. Madam Chair. Ms. Newman. Thank you. I have a point of order, Madam Chair. Yes, Senator Kennedy. Madam Chair, um, with respect, you allowed the witness to go at length and to change her testimony without her being subject to cross-examination. Are you going to allow us to have a second round of questioning? No, no, Senator Kennedy. What are you trying to cover up here? There is no cover up, and Mr. Padilla, Senator Padilla, you'll be allowed the 30 seconds well, I will, remaining. I want to time. appeal the ruling of the Thank chair. Thank you. I'd like to hear the, uh, I would the like responses to appeal. from the two Madam Chair, remaining. I have a point of order. I'd like to appeal the ruling of the chair. You allowed Your it. point of order was offered and, and responded I, to, and I, appeal and the I ruling of the chair and call for a roll call vote. You allowed a witness, let me state my case sure. with respect, you allowed a witness to go on for four or five minutes, change her testimony, knowing full well that neither Senator Cruz nor I could cross-examine cross her about her perjury. Senator Kennedy, would you allow the witness to finish I'm still responding to my question and order, then we can Mr. act Adam on Chair. your... Request. And I have, I think we Senator should Kennedy. have a second round. Senator Kennedy. And I am appealing the ruling of the chair. Senator, Senator Kennedy, Senator. would you allow the witnesses to re finish responding to my question and, and then I we can respond to your request? I am appealing the ruling of the chair. Senator Madam Kennedy, chair. 
Uh, I gave you a response to uh, your request of a second round of questioning. I have no intention on allowing a second round of questioning. Okay. And I'm there appealing is, your ruling. Th that is fine. There is no procedure that allows for a, for a roll call. call there vote. is no procedure for it that allows for a roll call vote in uh, this committee. This is a hearing. I have the gavel. I have responded no, to your up, request. This is uh, and I am going to return I, I to say, Senator Kennedy. I've never seen Kennedy's a chair try so hard to protect a witness and avoid answering why she just lied on the stand with her own words, her own opinion. Thank you so much for your request. Uh, it has been her responded to. Senator Padilla, not, your... There will be no cross-examination. Like, the witness shall be allowed to, to be lie sure, and no one will ask. So I, I think I have the floor. There, you have, you is, have been... You, have, is, you, you asked for, was there going to be another well, round of questions? Point of order. Your the answer is no. Is that we can't have a second round that the chair can allow a witness after we're finished with cross-examination, go on at length, change her testimony, potentially perjure herself, we're not allowed to cross-examine in a, in a, uh, a second round of questioning, which the, we do all the, the answer, time. The answer and, is and no, you Senator me Kennedy. I can't, and you now ask for a, a, a roll call vote to appeal your ruling. Madam you Chair, say I, say I there, there, no, you cannot. That's, that's Madam ridiculous. Chair, point of Thank personal you. privilege, please. Madam Chair, point of order. Sen Senator Hirono. You know, we have been witness to uh, literally witness badgering and now uh, badgering of the chair. She has issued her ruling. There is no appeal. Some of us would like to get on with this hearing. I'm sure you and to would. And to have to sit here and listen to all of you go off time and time and time again. And, and I just want to commend this witness, this nominee, for her comportment because of what her comportment says to me is that she is going to be a damn good judge. Can we get on with it, Madam Chair? So does every Democrat senator want to cover up the facts here? Is any Democrat so can senator we, interested uh, return in the direct to direct We'll be returning to Senator Padilla's question, or we will adjourn to these today's you, you want to adjourn? Go ahead. You can do that. Go ahead. Senator Padilla, I we want to give you well. your 30 you seconds. You might as well, you because Padilla, the questions are going to be, are you more handsome or beautiful or brilliant? And let's avoid the facts. Madam Chair, what I would like is an opportunity for the two remaining witnesses to respond to my question. And I would really like all members of the committee to pay them the respect they deserve and to let them finish. Ms. Newman. Thank you, Senator. I do agree with the premise of your question. I did have the opportunity to complete two clerkships, one at the Vermont Supreme Court and one at the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. When I was at the Second Circuit before Judge Peter Hall, I uh, was his third slate of uh, clerks at the very beginning of his career. And he discussed then and made it a point to uh, try to attract and hire a very diverse set of law clerks in the broadest sense, geographically diverse, uh, from different schools, many who had had different uh, careers before law school. He felt that that uh, really helped his decision-making process, and um, I hope if I'm so fortunate to be confirmed to do the same. Thank you. Judge Valenzuela. Uh, thank you, Senator Padilla. Um, I agree with your statement, and I agree with the comments of my colleagues. The only thing I would add is that um, I think the mentoring component of that is very important. Um, and that's why uh, for the past, uh, I think, five years or so, I have served on the California Judges Association's uh, Outreach Committee. Um, and I've uh, strived through that uh, committee to encourage and inspire the next generation of lawyers. Thank you to uh, all the nominees for your responses and, uh, again, for uh, uh, your composure and your dignity. And I will apologize to you for the decorum of some of my colleagues here today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Padilla. Thank you to uh, our nominees here. If there are further questions that uh, are going to be, uh, would like to be offered, uh, they, the deadline for submitting those is May 29th uh, by 5 uh, p.m. Questions for the record can, will uh, still be due to the nominees by that date and time. The record will likewise remain open until that time to submit letters and similar materials. Uh, everyone, please plan accordingly. With that, this hearing is adjourned.